Hi, well, so it's a pleasure to have Jeremy Costell speaking uh, about work on convergence of finite range exclusion processes in the KBZ equation to the KBZ fixed point. And as usual, um, if you have questions, just put them in the chat, or if you really feel like it's one that needs to be brought to Jeremy's immediate attention, you can unmute yourself and ask. So um, anyway, Jeremy, take it away. Okay, so thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, greetings from Toronto. Um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about um, our new proof of the finite range exclusions and KPZ converging to the fixed point. Um, the paper's been on the archive now since Monday, I think, and uh, so you can look at the details there. I'll try to give you the general idea, but I'm first going to um, I'm going to start as usual with an introduction to the KPZ class. And, and you know what's the uh, KBZ fixed point and how you get there from TASEP. And, and then I'll go into the, uh, into the new proofs. Um, and I, you know, given the situation, I, I definitely welcome questions. Uh, so just let me know as we're going. So, um, so in this audience, I don't think I really have to introduce the KBZ equation. Um, it's supposed to model lots of things like uh, coffee and uh, Tetris and uh, Directed random polymer free energies. Um, the these movies don't seem to be playing very well, but they are <laughs> they are movies, and um, and uh, so so it's in general anything where you have a a a a, 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 a stable phase invading an unstable phase uh, with randomness. Um, you're supposed to see in, in, in two dimensions or, or here one plus one dimensions because one of the directions is directed, uh, this uh, KPZ phenomenon. So it's a very, it's a very ubiquitous phenomenon. And um, so what we're gonna talk about is sort of the large scale things in this KPZ world and um, how we can attempt to try to prove universality. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so uh, I'm going to show you a, a movie, which probably won't play, uh, to show that. Um, so there was a little argument uh, that I had with Stas Smirnoff in a recent talk about whether uh, flame fronts are, are KPZ. And of course, there's two KPZs. There's a KPZ in, uh, in, uh, in their business. And there's our KPZ. Uh, it just happens that the initials are the same. And so he was arguing that flame fronts were their KPZ, and I was arguing that it depends on the uh, on the situation. And um, so if this movie plays, here's a very nice uh, thing I found on the Weather Channel, uh, and it's taking its sweet time to play. So so it'll come through in a second. Uh, wow, the the delay is enormous. It hasn't even shifted. Uh... It hasn't even shifted. Right. There it goes. Okay. So you're not you're not unfortunately going to be able to see how beautifully this thing burns through this flop on the ground, um, but in this kind of case, there's no question that what we're seeing is a uh, is a uh, Carter Parisi Jang front uh, moving through this uh, park. So this white fluff is stuff that fell from the trees and is being burned off. Okay, so um, if if only it had smoothly shown, gone through, you, you would see how, how, how nice a KPZ front this is. Anyway, so, so it's, it's kind of an ubiquitous phenomenon. And, um, and of course, it depends on a lot of fine tuning of the, of the actual situation. OK, so, um, so, so just to introduce the KPZ equation, um, there was a model that was much studied in the physics literature called ballistic aggregation. So we're over a, uh, an integer lattice and you have blocks falling from the sky and they're piling up in little towers. And if they were just piling up in little towers, uh, then the process would be trivial because we're gonna have the blocks falling independently at every site, maybe as an independent plus on process at every site. Um, but what happens here is that the block doesn't just, uh, you know, build up on just the one site, but if it has, if there's a neighboring site, it'll stick to it. So this stickiness causes kind of an outward um, movement in the thing. So the, the growth in these models is outward, and you can definitely see this in the big scale picture of ballistic aggregation, as well as up. And so it's this outward growth that causes the nonlinearities, and that nonlinearity is the key thing you're going to see in the universal scaling limits. So 
the carter prezi zhang equation is, is, is a model which was introduced essentially to, 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 to provide a continuum model for ballistic aggregation. So let's just go through the key terms here. So uh, there's a space-time white noise, which encapsulates the fact that the, that the blocks were falling independently at every space-time site uh, in, in the ballistic aggregation. And then there's a relaxation term, which uh, may not be so obvious where it comes from in the ballistic aggregation, but it's something, as you all know, if the other terms weren't there, you'd have the heat equation and that would tend to smooth the surface. So this is a smoothing term, which keeps the interface a reasonable interface. And then you have the key term, which is this lateral growth mechanism. So in the little picture of going outwards there under the lateral growth, uh, you see that the, if the growth is outwards, then the vertical component of the growth is more or less clearly a nonlinear function of the slope. And we choose the nonlinear function to be quadratic just because perhaps it's the simplest thing, or perhaps you could argue that that's the first term in a Taylor expansion of any function, which you can't just get rid of by some sort of simple transformation. Um, but as it turns out, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, a magic term. And, and no matter what you started with, there'd be a kind of renormalization to get you a quadratic term anyway. So, so this, is, this is some sort of canonical model uh, for random interface growth. Now, of course, uh, as you all know, uh, the Brownian motions are invariant for this process and, um, and uh, any uh, other initial data will immediately come local, locally Brownian. So this dxh squared term doesn't make literal sense and one needs to do a non-trivial renormalization, subtract an infinity from it to make sense of this equation. That kind of thing was done by Martin Herr to provide a local well-posedness of this equation. So we now know from Herr's theory or Guminelli's theory that KPZ is well-posed. And I, when I mean local, I mean, I mean for for t less than some fixed finite t, the, the whole thing is well posed. Um, but we're interested in probing very large scales. Um, and there, that kind of uh, theory is not going to help very much. Um, so what we're interested in is that as time goes to infinity, um, what we see in the growth is some constant times t. So the thing's growing at some constant rate. Uh, but then there's fluctuations on top of that of size t to the one third. And it's these uh, fluctuations, which are the universal objects, which are going to try to probe in the large scale limit. Uh, I called it A, A A's for airy processes. And these airy processes, which are universal stochastic processes, uh, live on a, on, a, on a spatial scale or a lateral scale of, of t to the two thirds at, at time t. Um, and they depend on the initial data. So the, the, the two to the one third and the constant usually don't depend on the initial data, but the, uh, but the, but the process you'll see, the particular area process you'll see will be different if you started out in a curved geometry or a flat geometry or something else. And that's what we want to get at. Um, okay. And, um, and, and the one other thing I wanted to mention is, is that the, uh, the, the, it's not the interface which is, which is expanding at rate t to the one third. The, the sort of size of the interface is roughly always the same, it, it, if you know what I mean. It, it's always going to be locally Brownian at scales less than t to the two thirds, um, or it'd be Brownian on scales less than t to the two thirds. This t to the one third is sort of a, 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 a global uh, up and down uh, random shift of the thing. Okay, so um, the way I'll just be describing this is completely equivalent is to to think that we're going to see uh, non-trivial uh, fluctuation objects at this what's called the one two three scaling of the of the height function, and this should in principle be true about all the many many models in the uh, universality class, the free energies of directed polymers and everything. Um, okay, so the one, two, three scaling is, is, is written here and it's just to, you know, to take, you know, uh, epsilon to the minus three halves as your time and epsilon, uh, as you, uh, you're on a lattice say, or well, there's no lattice here, sorry. You, you've rescaled space by epsilon minus one 
And then the height function should be of size epsilon minus a half. So you have to rescale it down by this. And of course, when you look at these fluctuations, you have to subtract an enormous constant C epsilon because you've rescaled into large time. And, uh, and then the limit of this should be some, some universal objects, which we're going to try to get at. OK, so this one, two, three scaling. And, and later, I'll be calling epsilon one half delta. And that'll mean exactly the same thing. OK. Um, so the big picture is that when you do such scalings, so, so there's this universe of models. And, and let me talk about this picture for a few minutes. This is a, a schematic of the universe of models with, um, with uh, the scaling, which is this one, two, three scaling, um, pulling all the models in principle, this is the conjecture, up into the, a, a special universal fixed point called the KBZ fixed point. Um, but actually, in this universe, there's there's not just one fixed point. There's there's two. There's a trivial fixed point called the Edwards-Wilkinson model, which is a Gaussian fixed point. And the KPZ equation itself uh, serves as a as a heteroclinic orbit between the Gaussian fixed point and the and the non-trivial strong coupling fixed point, the KPZ fixed point. And you can see that. So so I've I've drawn the KPZ equation here in in yellow. Uh, well, that's the yellow line. And um, it's got a parameter called lambda, which is the coupling constant. And as lambda goes to infinity, oh, well, of course, you have to rescale so that so that the really you should have a lambda to the minus one in front of the dxh squared and the lambda to the minus a half in front of the xc. Uh, then it should go to the kpz fixed point. Whereas when lambda goes to zero, that's the Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point. So now you know what the Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point is. It's just the kpz equation with no nonlinearity in it, which is a which is a linear equation. It's just, or it's the Nullenbeck process in, in higher dimensions. And, um, and, and that's the kind of thing we're going to try to prove. OK. So, so in this universe, there, there's lots of models, like the ballistic aggregation model I talked about, or maybe I didn't mention them, but Eden models. So there'd be these growth models, which aren't directed, and first passage percolation. And, and you know this is a very generic thing. If you look at a dynamic easing model and you put a little blob of stuff and you put a magnetic field on so that blob is favored, then the blob will grow. And as the blob grows, uh, the boundary uh, should, in principle, um, look like this KPZ fixed point in two dimensions. Um, it, it, without the magnetic field, on the other hand, the, the boundary between uh, between two, you know, a plus and minus phase in the dynamic easing model. So no magnetic field. So there's no favored phase. It'll just sort of fluctuate back and forth. And um, that fluctuating back and forth is essentially what this Edwards Wilkinson um, model uh, encapsulates. Um, they, the two uh, fixed points have different symmetries uh, and different scalings. So, so this, this sort of flat region here is supposed to be the scaling in which these models are sucked into the Edwards Wilkinson fixed point, but they're, they're in a one, two, four scale because that's the scaling of the Edwards Wilkinson model. And uh, if you look at it, of course, that means that you don't see anything for a longer time in Edwards Wilkinson than you do in, in KPZ. Because KPZ is a super diffusive model, not a, not a sub diffusive model. Things happen faster in KPZ. Um, so the symmetries of the Edwards Wilkinson, the, the Edwards Wilkinson is, is, is symmetric under, under uh, heights go to minus heights, and it's also symmetric under time goes to minus time. And if you think about the boundary fluctuating back and forth in the uh, dynamic easing model with no magnetic field, of course it's like that. It just sort of fluctuates, and you could watch it backwards or forwards, it wouldn't make, or upside down, it wouldn't make any difference. Um, Whereas the KPZ fixed point has, has, a, has different symmetry. It's got what's called the skew time reversal invariance, which is that if you, if you reverse time, then the, the height functions look like minus the height function. So you have to do both of them together to get a symmetry of the KPZ fixed point. And now uh, to get at the KPZ fixed point, uh, there's a couple of models, a couple of very special models, TASEP and a few friends of TASEP, which we're able to essentially get exact formulas for and, uh, and then just rescale them. And then that's how we know what's the KBZ fixed point. So let me go into that story. OK, so TASEP, I'll do this quickly because I think most of you know what it is. Um, TASEP is sort of the simplest discretization of the KPZ equation. It's a discrete model uh, with the same structure as the KPZ equation. Uh, it doesn't scale to the KPZ equation, but it's still a discretization of the KPZ equation. So, um, 
so they've got a height function here. And the height function is a simple random walk path, just meaning, so the height function is over the integer lattice. And simple random walk path just means it goes up or down by one at each step. So that's the state space. Um, but the such height functions can also be encoded by particles. A particle just means there's an up at that place. So here we've got particles and we've got height functions. And for the solvability, there's one little condition which seems to be necessary, which is that there should be a rightmost particle. It's, it's a little unclear if without that there's solvability. Um, there's some formulas, but they're very awkward. Um, but it doesn't matter very much because that rightmost particle can be kind of as far to the right as you want. So it, it's practically, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, so that's the state space. And the dynamics is just that uh, local maxes jump to local mins at rate one. Or in the particle language, uh, particles are attempting jumps to the right at rate one and uh, are only allowed to do it if there's no particle in the way. So, so here, here I'll just, this should actually work because it's not a, it's not a movie, it's just me clicking. So the, the, height fi the, the local maxes are jumping to local mins and the particles are jumping with them. And since nobody believes me that it's a discretization of KPZ, I'll prove it to you. Um, the rate of jumping down is just minus two times the indicator function that there's a local max. The, the, the minus is because it's jumping down. The two is because when it jumps down, it jumps down by two. And um, well, a little calculation you can do um, because functions that take only the, things that take only the values plus or minus one are, there's lots of little miracles that can occur, um, that this thing's exactly equal to a half times the, the backwards looking gradient of H times the forward looking gradient of H uh, plus the discrete Laplacian of H and minus one. So there's an exact calculation you can do yourself. It takes about 20 minutes um, or <laughs> depends who you are. And uh, the minus one you should think of as the minus enormous constants in, in the model. And otherwise you see this, this same uh, quadratic nonlinearity in the slope, <laughs> whatever that means um, of the H and the Laplacian here. So, so, so in that sense, taste of the discretization of KPZ. Okay, and here's a picture of, of the thing. If I started with, um, with wedge initial data, so wedge initial data just means all particles to the, uh, the, the uh, left of the origin initially and all empty sites to the right of the origin initially. And you let the thing go. And after some time, uh, then you get this blue thing. The, the red curve is just a quadratic to, to, for your eye. And um, well, okay, this, uh, this blue thing is, or, or the blue thing minus the red thing is this universal process called the ARI2 process. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so uh, the solvability uh, comes from the fact that we can actually solve TSEP. Uh, solve here means uh, compute exactly the transition probabilities. And um, as I'll describe in a second, it's a fairly old story. The transition probabilities have been computed in different forms for a while, but um, this is a formula which is conducive to passing to the one, two, three scaling limit. And so let me just read through the formula quickly. Uh, there's only so much you can grasp in a few minutes, but um, the you start taste up with some initial condition, which is drawn here. And then uh, at a later time, you'd like to know what the distribution of the height function is. And as we all know, uh, H in X is a stochastic process. So what I'd really like is to know its finite dimensional distribution. So here are the M dimensional distributions of H at time T are given by a determinant. And inside the determinant is some operator, which encodes the initial data, the final data, which is these AIs at XIs, and the time. So let me just go through a little bit how this, how it does that. Um, so there's a, there's a matrix or, or an operator kernel, depending on how you like to look at it. Oh, and by the way, this determinant is being computed on L2 of the positive integers. Okay. So this Q uh, is just the transition probabilities of a geometric random walk uh, jumping down. Okay, so that's what Q is. Uh, Q bar is a kind of twist of Q, which I don't wanna go into. It's an analytic continu continuation of Q to, 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 uh, to, to Y bigger than X. Um, and R, uh, there's an R for the initial condition and R for the final condition. And they're just given by 
Essentially, I uh, say for the final condition, uh, the transition probabilities of a geometric lock, which has to stay above the final condition. And what do I mean transition probabilities? Well, the Rs have inside them other variables, which I could call u1 and u2, which you can think of the operator as an operator kernel. So this RFC should really be RFC of u1, u2. And so you, you, you take a geometric random walk starting at u1 and, and you ask that it goes to u2 staying above uh, the, the final condition. And then there's some a few other things in here. And then there's these mediating operators, e to the t over two grad minus, which, which sort of mediate between the initial and final condition and, and tell you how this thing evolves to time t. And they're, they're essentially transition uh, probabilities of, of, uh, of Poisson processes. OK. OK, so that's the formula. And there don't seem to be any questions. Uh, <laughs> okay, if no one wants to ask a question. So we, we take such a formula and um, and where does it come from? Well, um, well, in 97, Schutz was able to solve TASEP in the sense of, of asking if you had n particles, um, what's the probability given that they were starting in certain n positions at time zero, what's the probability that they're in n different positions at time t? And that's given by an n by n determinant. Um, a little bit reminiscent of the Colin McGregor formula. Um, but the things inside the Fred Holm determinant are, are strange contour integrals, which are sort of hard to interpret. And the problem with such a formula is that the type of problem we're dealing with, we really want to start with, um, with an enormous number of particles and ask where five of them are at a later time or m of them to get the m-dimensional distributions. But that means one would have to integrate this formula over a lot of extraneous extra variables at time t. And it was completely unclear how one could take a limit of that, except in some special cases. So one special case is with uh, wedge initial data. This matrix has some toplet structure. So Johansson was able to, to study it and get the, um, the large scale GUE asymptotics of TASEP. And, um, and then Sasamoto noticed something amazing about the formula, which is that because of certain functional relations in these contour integrals, one was able to write the formula as a, as a sign determinantal point process over a space of gelfand zeitlin patterns. And um, Sasamoto and Borden and their co-authors were able to turn, turn this into a, a, a way to compute the thing that I I, I wanted to compute on the previous page um, with a kernel which could in principle be obtained if one could only solve the following problem, which is that one's given some Charlier polynomials, uh, which, are, which are just the orthogonal polynomials on Z plus uh, with respect to the uh, exponential distribution, with respect to the Poisson distribution. And, um, and now you, um, now you take those Charlier polynomials and you shift them in a certain way with respect by, by the initial condition of your problem. And now you say, uh, what are the biorthogonal pairs now to those shifted Charlier polynomials? That turns out to be a, a non-trivial problem, which there wasn't really any method uh, in existence to solve. They were able to solve it in the flat case by guessing. And um, by looking at the structure of the KPZ fixed point, which I'll show you in a second, um, we were able to guess what these biorthogonal pairs would be. And then once you guess them, it's actually not that hard to, to check it. Um, the biorthogonal pairs can be solved by certain um, hitting times of, of, the, uh, of the initial data. Okay, and once you have the formula that I showed you on the page before, well, you can just check that it's true by checking that it solves the forward or backward equation for TASEP. And, and then you know that it's the, so, so in retrospect, one can just take a rabbit out of hat and say, here's the formula and you can check it's true. Okay, now in the one, two, three scaling limit, uh, which I described before, we want to go to the universal fixed point. Uh, what happens is, is that these mediating operators, the mediating operators look like, as I said, e to the t grad minus, and then, then they have beside them a bunch of q to the minus some powers. And um, now q, which was, the, which was the transition probabilities of a geometric uh, random walk, turns out to have a nice inverse. Um, so what you're trying to compute is the thing I've written here with this epsilon to the minus three halves upstairs. 
And if you just look formally, so you just take the formula for Q inverse and write that as e to the log of the thing, um, then, then you can see quite easily that, that what happens is, is that you're in a very finely tuned uh, regime where the, the, this grad minus and this a half log one plus two grad plus, it's been tuned so that there's a cancellation at, at first order and at second order. So, so it's the third order which counts. And so the sort of thing in these models, which is something like a generator, uh, ends up being d cubed. So, so KPZ is a world in which the d squareds of Brownian motion and diffusion processes have been somehow replaced by d cubes. And of course, e to the t d cubed uh, is the is the uh, airy semigroup, and it's uh, the the fundamental solutions are just airy functions, and that's where all these airy functions come from. So, e, whenever you see uh, e to the t d cubed, just think that's a rescaled airy function. And the the initial and final conditions are even more clear. They they just become transition probabilities of uh, Brownian motion staying above the final condition or below the initial condition. And so now I can just write for you what's the um, the KBZ fixed point formula. So the um, the fixed point is a Markov process. It's a one two three invariant Markov process, and it it is just the one two three. And it is just the Markov process with these transition probabilities. So you start with some h zero, and at time t you've got some new height function. Uh, the, now it's all in the continuum. These are these are uh, functions over the real line, and you'd like to know. It's m-dimensional distributions, and the m-dimensional distributions, not surprisingly, are given by a determinant of a kernel, uh, which uh, on the m-fold product of L2, uh, which uh, the kernel encodes the initial condition and the time and the x's and the a's in the way described below. So the the um, the the uh, from your initial condition, you try to construct a, a, a transform of H0, which I call KH0, which is the Brownian scattering transform of H0, which I'll describe in a second. But once you've constructed that, the evolution in T, and if you like, if you think of calling it the evolution in X's and A's, is trivial. It's just, uh, it's just a conjugation by, by the airy semigroup, uh, sort of perturbed by, by diffusion semigroups and, 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 and shifts. Um, so, so the story is, is that you, you lift your, your initial condition up into the world of operators or kernels, and then up in that world, the whole evolution is just linearized. Um, and that's the, you know, exactly what we mean by a completely integrable system. So, so, so this KBZ fixed point is a is a completely integrable Markov process in the sense that it's a, a Markov process whose transition probabilities, the problem of calculating its transition probabilities is a is a completely integrable system. Okay, so let me just describe this Brownian scattering transform. So you 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 start with your H zero, which is written here in red, and you ask what's the uh, what's the probability for a Brownian motion starting at u one and conditioned to go to u two. Um, ever crosses below this function H0. You have to write it like that because H0 being uh, just a, a zero at one point and minus infinity at other points is actually a very natural H0. That's what you get from the scaling of the wedges. So really we're talking about upper semi-continuous functions and we're asking whether the Brownian motion hits their hypograph. Hypograph just being the closed set, which is the stuff below an upper semi-continuous function. So, so we asked this question of whether it hits and, and that gives you some numbers and that's called P hit U1, U2. And of course you can only do this on a finite interval. But then the thing asks you to do a very strange thing as L goes to infinity, you want to uh, solve the heat equation backwards on either side of this P hit and then take the limit as L goes to infinity. That sounds like something insane. But in fact, it's not because for any t positive, the, the airy group uh, smooths out the p hit enough that this turns out to be a perfectly reasonable um, operation. And you, you get a well-defined limit. And uh, that, uh, that thing, you can, call, you can think of the, the, the operator now as the, as the whole thing for any positive t. And from h0 into that, into that thing is, is a continuous bijection from upper semi continuous functions into the trace class. Okay. Okay, so that's the KPZ fixed point. Um, and now let me describe two, uh, two more 
to more ways of writing the KPZ flex point. And then that'll be the end of the introduction. Um, so, so from that description, one can actually get another description, uh, the one at the top of this page, uh, as uh, the finite dimensional distributions of the KPZ fixed point uh, coming from certain uh, integrable partial differential equations, uh, in particular, the, the Kadams of Pechasvili equation. So um, the F, which is the, which is the N dimensional distribution of the KBZ fixed point, it, it turns out to be that if you, if you take the log derivative of F or, or the second log derivative of F, that's the, that's the trace of a matrix Q. And that matrix Q uh, actually satisfies a matrix equation, which is a matrix version of this uh, KP equation. Uh, so this is a known um, uh, integral PDE. It satisfies it in, in strange unexpected variables, which is the, the sum of the Xs and the sum of the Rs. The Rs here are just the, the distribution function variables and the Xs are the positions. And T of course is time, but there's, there's N Xs and there's N Rs. And, and so, so it's a slightly strange thing. Um, it's easiest to understand in one, uh, not one dimension, I mean, uh, for, for, for one dimensional distributions, so if you have one dimensional distributions, you don't have to go through this matrix because the trace of a matrix is just the matrix. And, um, and so the second log derivative of the one dimensional distributions actually satisfy the classic KP equation. So that's an equation in these bizarre variables, uh, T and then X is the position and then R is the distribution function variable. Uh, if you were in, for example, the flat case, then there'd be no X because there's no spatial dependence. And so the X part of the KP drops out and you just get the Kortweg de Vries equation. Uh, KP is just the two dimensional version of the Kortweg de Vries equation. And um, well, this is something you discover and uh, it's completely unclear why all this is true. Uh, it's sort of a strange example of a, of a physical law which is derived by algebra. Okay, um, perhaps the strangest thing about it is that the, the n-dimensional distribution should themselves, each one, satisfy an equation at all. And there doesn't seem to be uh, any way, uh, so, so far we have not been able to see this in any um, microscopic model converging to the KP equation. Except for the remarkable fact that in the uh, KPZ equation itself, uh, all but one of the exact uh, one point formulas which were discovered also do satisfy KP. So there's a bit of a mystery there. Okay, and then there's a third description of the KPZ fixed point as a variational problem, uh, which I'll just go through quickly. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you start with your initial data H0 and then you, you wanna know the, the function at time T, then as, as a process in X, uh, it's given by a variational formula of the, of the laxolinic type with a sort of strange noise called the Aries sheet. Um, for a while, we didn't know at all what this Aries sheet was, or even if they were unique, but then uh, Duncan de Verin and Valent Virag were able to construct the, the Aries sheet as a strong limit in a certain case, uh, where, there's, where what you do is you put Brownian last passage percolation on the airy line ensemble. And because it's a strong limit, that means it's actually a functional of the airy line ensemble. So that means that the airy sheet is a completely well-defined unique object. And although you don't have formulas like the ones I described to you for the airy sheet, so the, 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 um, the KBZ fixed point seems to be a completely integrable Markov process, but the airy sheet itself doesn't seem to have that same thing as far as we know but you do get a lot of geometric information. So now there are these two dual ways of looking at the KPZ fixed point. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction. And then the, the big question is, um, how are we ever gonna prove um, convergence uh, to the KPZ fixed point? So we've got a situation where we have, um, where we, we have you know, so, some solvable models uh, and we can prove convergence to the fixed point because we solve them, we actually just get, uh, we find out what their Markov transition probabilities are, and then we take a limit and we get the KBZ fixed point. Or maybe we have uh, partially solvable models like ASAP. And if you work very, very hard in ASAP or models like that six vertex model, uh, 
you know, uh, KPZ itself, uh, you get some formulas for some things, usually uh, one-dimensional distributions, usually starting with wedge initial data. And then, uh, and then you scale that and you get what would be the formula in that special case for the KPZ fixed point, which would give you something like GUE. Of course, in our, in our picture, GUE and GOE are just, um, are, are just funny self-similar solutions of the KP equation. You can just check from the self-similarity that the, the KP equation quickly reduces to the, to the panel of A2 equation in those cases. Okay, and then we have all these non-solvable models and we're hoping to find some way to, to prove everything converges to this KPZ fixed point. But there's a terrible problem um, that the, that the um, if, you, if you have a, 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 you know, a Markov process and all you know is its transition probabilities and you're trying to prove things converge to it, it's not terribly clear how you would ever do that except by, by you know, computing exact transition probabilities and taking a limit. Um, because we're sort of lacking a good enough characterization of the fixed point. So I showed you three characterizations, but unless you are lucky and find some model where one of those characterizations is approximately true on the micro scale, uh, it's not at all clear how you're going to be able to pass to the limit. So what we've had is a big effort on solvable models uh, from 2000 to 2010 and then partially solvable models from 2010 to present, where you basically uh, work extremely hard in some cases. Um, so for example, I worked for several years to try to get a formula for ASAP, starting with flat initial data and try to get uh, GOE from it. Um, but uh, although there's a formula, <laughs> you can kind of see it goes to GOE. It's unbelievably hard to prove. Um, so, 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 so in the past, uh, this past summer, um, Balant Virag and um, me and Shurav Sarkar, who's a postdoc at U of T, um, just working a few blocks away from each other without knowing, uh, we independently found proofs that the KPZ equation converges to the fixed point. And when I say the KPZ equation, I mean for essentially any initial data and multidimensional distributions. Um, so, so the proofs um, start with the fact that we actually know a lot about KPZ, which I'll talk to you about that later. And, and, and um, so one only needs actually to prove convergence on a dense class of initial data. Um, on the other hand, um, balance starts with a very different class of initial data from us. Um, balance using, um, he's working essentially in the oconnell your uh, model and he's using this fantastic symmetry uh, um, in the in the initial and final data uh, of the model uh, to show that if you if you only know the one point distribution starting from all sorts of VBPs then then you actually know everything in those models uh, but you definitely need some sort of approximate version of the variational formula and um, certainly, as far as uh, Ballant can tell, um, he needs at least partial solvability of the models uh, to, to get anywhere. Um, so our method's based on energy estimates. And um, uh, the, the one thing I can advertise is it works at least for one class of not solvable models, which is the finite range exclusion processes. So in finite range exclusions, it's just like KSEP, except the particles are allowed to make jumps, not just of size one, but maybe size five. They're still not allowed to jump if there's somebody in the way, but they're allowed to make more than nearest neighbor jumps. And of course, in the height functions, that means uh, the function moves up and down in little blocks. Um, but uh, th there's there's a restriction that that um, that we can't do it for any initial data for the for the finite range of exclusions. So, so now I'm gonna, um, oh, there's a couple of questions and maybe I'll answer the questions. Uh, oh, I have an answer to your question. <laughs> uh, should I, should I, okay, I'll, I won't. Seems, seems they're happy with the answer. Okay, okay, so now I'm gonna go into, into our proof and I'll try to slow down a little bit. Okay, so, um, so I wanna compare two Markov processes. Uh, maybe, maybe for illustrative purposes, I'll start by comparing ASEP and TASEP. Okay, 
But right now it could be any two markup processes, P1 and P2. And um, PIHTB is just the transition probabilities of the process I. Uh, so you're starting with H. It's just H because we're going to be using these KPZ things. So the markup process takes values in H's, which are height functions. But it doesn't matter here. Uh, and that's the probability that at time t, starting with h, that you're in some set b. Okay, so so um, so the transition probabilities, of course, evolve uh, according to the Kolmogorov equations, uh, dt p equals l p, where l is the generator. And now, I, I don't know, I don't think I need to assume this, but in our case, um, there's an invariant measure, and it's a common invariant measure for the two processes, which I'll call nu. And with respect to that invariant measure, I have densities. And uh, densities evolve duly to, to transition probabilities. So the density, which I'll call FITH at time t, um, assuming there's a density, uh, evolves according to the adjoint equation, DTF equals L star of F. OK. And you put that together, and you get this very easy equation for the difference of the two transition probabilities. Now, um, I, I definitely want to emphasize that this is not a, a deep observation, though as far as I can tell, I've never seen it anywhere before. Uh, probably no one ever used it before because it was always useless. Because if two, uh, if two markup processes have the same invariant measure and you're looking at a long time and trying to compare them, well, the answer is they're both in their invariant measure, so there's not much to say. So we're in a kind of special case where you can have a non-trivial effect because of this you know, uh, lateral zooming out as well to see these non-trivial processes. OK, so let me just describe what you get. So, so P1 F0 D nu just means instead of starting with an H, I started with, a, with a, uh, some density F0 nu. So that's my initial measure. And then at time t, I want to be in subset b. And I, and I compare that between t, p1 and p2. Then that's given by an integral of f2, which is the, which is the evolving density of process 2. And then the difference of the generators acting on p1. And then you integrate with respect to the invariant measure. Um, by the way, you, you don't need to have the same invariant measure to get a formula like this. I, I just am using it that way. And, and you can prove this, you know, to be honest, without writing down the proof. If I asked you to prove this, you'd all have proved it in about five minutes. Um, so whatever your favorite way is to prove this, you'll, you'll discover this. But you see, this formula is really the kind of thing we need. Because um, P1, which is going to be P of TASEP, I know a lot about, as I've explained. <laughs> we, we know what it is. And you see, all the, all the problem has the L1 minus L2 has been thrown onto the P1. So in principle, this is a way to try to get bootstrap your way out of a lot of information about P1 to a new process P2. OK, so we'll take P1 to be TASEP. And the because I'm just using as an illustrative example ASEP and TASEP, the difference of the generators of ASEP and TASEP is nothing but symmetric simple exclusion. Symmetric simple exclusion being um, being the um, uh, the model where the, the random walks are just jumping symmetrically. Okay, so when L1 and L2 is symmetric simple exclusion, then because it's um, it's a, 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 a self-adjoint operator. I can kind of integrate by parts and produce a Dirichlet form type object, uh, which is what's written on the in the lower right corner. Um, so I put a grad on the F ASAP and I put a grad on the P TASEP, and then I see the difference between TASEP and ASAP. And we're working uh, in rescaled variables. We're, we're on a we're on a lattice of size epsilon. And I've rescaled by epsilon to the minus three halves the time. So, so this is all in this is all being done now for the rescaled uh, processes. Okay. Now, I know there's one little twist here, which is that um, usually you think of the invariant measures for things like TASAP as invariant measures for the particles. Uh, so, so the invariant measure for the particles is just product measure. Uh, every site you either put a particle or or put a hole with probably uh, P and Q, so you go to are these are Bernoulli measures. 
um, we'll take them the same the same probability, so a half a half. Um, but here we actually have a height function. Um, so the height function isn't completely determined by the particles because there's a there's a one one uh, one number missing, which is the which is I could I could just declare to be the height at, at zero. So so from the particles you can make a a height function which is zero at zero, but then you you add this height at zero to make a, a generic height function. So that's called H zero. So here, it, there's a question from Lee Chang. Yeah. Do the generators include the vertical shifts? Yeah, right. So that's what I was going to say. So the the um, so so now I'm I'm going to work on height functions, and it turns out to be important to do this. And the invariant measure is actually uh, the the product of the two-sided random walk, and the and the the H zero has to be in Lebesgue measure. So it's not a probability measure. So Lebesgue measure here, meaning because we we're, we're just in a, a discrete model, it's um, it's on the epsilon one half of Z, okay? Um, but with Lebesgue measure, so the so the measure gives mass epsilon one half to every every site of that lattice, and that's still you know uh, nice and reversible and very nice, <laughs> and it's not a probability measure. But everything else, it, it, it sort of you think it matters, it, it doesn't matter. Um, There's another question from Lee Chang. Yeah. Does the quadratic form in the bottom of the page hold with the vertical shifts? Yes, sure, sure. Otherwise, it would be a, a problem. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so grad x uh, now means um, so. So, in 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 this formula, what grad x of f means is you take f, uh, you take f of a height function h, and now at x you flip uh, the the thing from a local max to a local min, if you can, and then look at the difference of the f. Okay, that's what grad x f means. So f of h x minus f of h, where h x just means if you're allowed to flip the 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 from a local max to a local min, or or the other way at x, do it and to calculate the difference. That's what grad x means. Okay, so is is everything clear? Okay, so. Okay, so here's the energy method. Um, so the, the formula at the top of the page is just the one from the previous page. And you see, uh, we have to get uh, information about F ASAP. I have plenty of information about grad X P TASAP, and I'll, I'll explain that what that is in a second. Um, as I said, you, you could compute it. Um, but grad X F ASAP, we don't have too much information about it, right? That's, that's our problem. So the information I'll use is just what I get by differentiating the L2 norm. So if you differentiate the L2 norm, well, here it's written in integral form, then you see you get again the Dirichlet form. Uh, that's the key thing I'm using. Okay, so, so ASAP has an has a anti-symmetric part and a symmetric part, and the symmetric part is just the, the generator of symmetric simple exclusion. So, so the, the L2 norm decreases, and the rate it decreases is epsilon minus 3 half of this sum of grad x f. Okay, now that's nice because that means uh, that decrease can never be more than the initial F zero squared. So as long as F zero is in L two, uh, the the Dirichlet form there is going to be bounded by that initial F zero squared, the L two norm of F zero. So what that means is I can take the formula at the top of the page and just do Schwartz. So by Schwartz the square difference of the probabilities is bounded by the initial L2 and then the Dirichlet form of P TASEP. So that's a nice formula. You think, okay, now we're really getting somewhere uh, because grad X P TASEP, I can compute it. <laughs> it's great. In fact, you compute it, it's something very simple. Uh, it's not too hard to see that because uh, TASEP is skew time reversal invariant, if you take grad X P TASEP, so grad X P TASEP is acting on the initial data in P TASEP. P TASEP is a transition probability and it's acting on the initial H. Well, if you take grad X, what it does is it flips the initial data, but through, through skew time reversal invariance, that just asks you if the H evolving backwards in time uh, has an arg max and a max at that point. Okay, so that's this formula. Grad X P TASEP is P TASEP of argmax and max. And you can just read this as grad X P TASEP 
is actually a probability distribution, a probability in x in the epsilon lattice and h0 in the epsilon 1 half lattice. OK? Now, now what I wrote is a lie. <laughs> it's almost that. There's a tiny problem that the argmaxes aren't necessarily unique. So that sum is actually would be the number of argmaxes. But the number of argmaxes of a random walk is something very, very easy to control. So, so although that thing's not one, it's less than or equal to some constant, which is the number of argmaxes, and, and one can control that. OK, now this is only true if the set B is the set of H's, which is less than or equal to some where, where, where it's the sets which I wrote. <laughs> OK, so it's very important to take such sets. Okay, so now you think, okay, I'm really getting somewhere. Now, now, now let's calculate the Dirichlet form of Gradic, uh, of, of PTASEP, and you calculate it and you discover that the right hand side with this epsilon minus three half of the Dirichlet form is exactly order one, and you learn absolutely nothing from this whole method. Okay, it's not a very easy calculation, but it's true. <laughs> the problem is, if only the sum were inside, then the thing would work because grad XP is this probability measure. You see, if you look at this second thing where it says epsilon minus five halves and then the, bra the, the, the sums are inside the square, inside the square though there, the sum over X is in the sum over H zero because this thing was just a probability is just one. So inside the square, you have epsilon to the three halves squared and then the epsilon minus five halves just gives you an epsilon one half in the end. And then you're, in, then you're in business. Then the whole thing was less than epsilon one half. Now this epsilon five halves, uh, you might wonder where it comes from, but that's just epsilon minus three halves. And then I pulled off an epsilon so that the, the X measure is a, is, a, is a probability measure. That's all that's, that's from. Okay, just to try to, the scaling here is very hard to get straight. Okay. So, so the problem is, is that the method, as I've shown you, tells you absolutely nothing. But if the sum inside were there, then, then it would work. So, so here's the trick. You take the, the formula at the top of the page, and you say, I'm not going to be so greedy. Um, so oh, you should, you should ask, well, why, why is it that the Dirichlet form was order 1 instead of being order epsilon 1 half? And the answer is, and this involves some intricate calculation with Bessel process, um, that the Grad XP is actually a, an extremely intermittent object. It's, it's a probability, but it's all full of spikes. And so it's, it's in L1 nicely, as a probability should be, but it's definitely, in, the L2 norm is enormous. Um, so to get rid of this intermittency, what you want to do is some averaging. So if you look at the formula at the top of the page, you say, I just won't be so greedy about my B. I'll take Bs of the same form, H is less than some G. But what I'll do is I'll shift them around in space and, um, and height a little bit. So I'll, I'll move my G up and down a little bit, a macroscopic distance, and I'll move it sideways a little bit, a macroscopic distance. Now, if you do that, then the shifts on the B, because of the, of the homogeneity of P TASEP in space, the shifts on the B can be turned into shifts on the H. But if I take grad X of a shifted H, that's a grad x plus y of the h unshifted. So what that means is that if I take shifts on the b in the formula at the top, at the top of the page, and I'm allowed to, it, it may not look, you may say, oh, I'm not allowed to because there's a grad x p there. But I can take that grad x p over to, the, over to the f first and then do the shifts and then take it back. So that's not a problem. So that means that I can actually put the, some shifts inside the, inside the square. And then by Young's inequality, it's all fine, and all I have to do is pay a price of the, if I shift over a tiny set A, then I pay a terrible price in A. So A is a little macroscopic shift in, in heights and, and, and sideways. I pay a bad price in A, so it's a terrible estimate in A, but I get the epsilon one half. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So then you get the formula at the bottom of the page. And this P bars- So, so, so Jeremy, you, you, uh, it's not just that you get the result for a random B, you could, you could formulate an explicit deterministic condition on initial data for which this would hold, right? It's sort of an eigenvalue problem of, of TASA with 
Well, Stop not exactly, because you have to remember, I also, I also need, well, I, maybe I don't understand your, your question exactly. So, so here, if you look at the form at the bottom of the page, I've averaged over the Bs and I've averaged over my initial data with this F0, both. Is that what you, is that the answer to your question or maybe I didn't under, you could re-ask it? Oh, maybe. I thought that I th uh, the question was whether the condition on B only involves TASAP, which you understand. And, and it's a deterministic condition. Uh, it, I'm not really doing anything with TASEP at this point, except using the fact that I have an exact formula for grad XP. And the fact that this, this, this translation in, in variance of TASEP means that I can take those shifts and throw them onto the H's. So, okay, yeah, maybe, I don't quite understand your question, so so, and I apologize. Um, that so so, if you look at the form at the bottom of the page, the way I interpret it is, if if I'm a, if I'm willing to be a bit fuzzy in my initial data, and a bit fuzzy in my b. So p bar means I've averaged over b in some in some macro small macro box, and the macro box is size a in in heights and and sideways. Um, th then I get this thing, <laughs> and epsilon is going to zero. So it tells me that as long as I was willing to be a bit fuzzy in my in my in my p's, it it's it converges to the fixed point because TASEP converges to the fixed point, right? So I just take a limit and that shows that ASEP converges to the fixed point for those fuzzy things. But the fuzziness doesn't even matter because if I take a G, I can take a G to be uniformly continuous, and then I shift it sideways a little bit, I make I can tell what error I made. Or if I shift it up and down by A, I've only made an error A. So there's no problem. This is enough information. And so this tells you that as long as I was willing to accept that I my initial data had a density in L2, then I've actually got convergence of ASEP to the fixed point. So now this initial data in L2, that's again, that's not much of a condition. So this, so initial data in L2 are dense. And here's the picture. <laughs> I, I Dense, I mean, in the topology of uniform convergence on compact sets. So my compact set, so red is my function I'm trying to approximate. And, and blue is going to be my approximating thing. I, I want to approximate on minus L to L. So I look at, make a little, I, and I want to approximate uh, with an error delta. So I, 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 I put little delta squared intervals in there. And I, I make little delta errors at each end of those intervals. And then I patch in uh, Brownian bridges in between, or it, in the discrete case, random walk bridges. And you can check that the L2 uh, cost of doing such a thing is is bounded. Okay, so I could so 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 with with initial data bounded in L two, I I can approximate anything arbitrarily closely. Jeremy, there's another question, Li Cheng. F not is the it's not the height function. It's the density. It's the height. density of the initial height functions with respect to the measure new, <laughs> which is not a probability measure. But it, but F zero D nu is a probability measure. Okay, is that is that helpful or okay? Please keep asking. Um, so I, I want to try to finish. Um, so so let me give you an informal description of this, and that'll help me explain how I do KBZ equation and um, and uh, and finite range exclusions. So so there's an informal way to describe this whole thing, why it should work. It, you know. We're trying to calculate e to the t uh, rescale generator of ASAP because that's those are the transition probabilities of ASAP, right? And of course, that's just e to the t l TASAP plus epsilon minus three halves symmetric simple exclusion because the ASAP generator is just the TASAP generator plus the symmetric generator. But then you know that the symmetric simple exclusion generator wants an epsilon minus two in front of it to get something macro. So, well. You go epsilon minus three halves, it's order epsilon a half. And that's what we just proved, basically. We just found the way to, to make this rigorous. Now, now you can see exactly how you get KBZ. So KBZ, you approximate by WASEPs, weakly asymmetric simple exclusion, which just means I have the same TASEP, but I put a delta instead of an epsilon minus, instead of an epsilon one half in front of the properly rescaled symmetric symbol exclusion. That's what WASEP means. And now you can see 
everything I said, so, so that will approximate KPZ already rescaled uh, one, two, three, but with deltas that I described the, the, the initial thing, which says that there should be a delta in front of the dxh squared and a delta one half in front of the noise. And so as delta goes to zero, this KPZ, we're trying to prove it goes to the fixed point. So, um, AR, yes. Yeah, maybe you could just help me with understanding. How, how is the averaging over B related to averaging over the initial data? This is what I don't understand. Oh, there, there are two different things, but they're morally similar. <laughs> That's all. So, so, um, so, so averaging over the initial data, I call writing F0 D nu instead of H. I think of that as averaging over the initial data. Averaging over B, I could probably try to write it like that also, but I, I don't feel like doing it. So <laughs> what I, I, I just take my B and, I, and I, just, I, I just shift the B around like this in a little box. And I allowed to do that on a small macroscopic box without paying any price in the result. But if I do that, it washes away the intermittency in grad XP. That's the idea. When you say you shift B, you, you literally just add a constant to everything inside of, you know, B is a set of functions, right? Right, right, right. So no, I, I do it in two ways. I add a, I add a little constant uh, uh, to, to, to G, because B is a set of, B, look at the thing which says B equals H such that H is less than G. It really has to be those kind of sets. Um, and um, so what I take is I, 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 I add a constant to G, a little random constant to G, and I also take G and I shift it sideways by a little random constant. You got to do both because you need the averaging in the X and you need the averaging in the heights. Okay, and so no, because no. you're doing constants that translates back into some shift on the initial data. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So the, the, if, if you want to learn this method, like how the averaging works, the averaging over the heights is almost trivially gets you inside the square with, with uh, Young's inequality. The averaging over the X is a little bit more complicated because now you have to see how the X translates into the grads. Uh, but that's just a certain covariance of this grad operation. Is, is that make sense? Okay, so let me just go back to the KPZ because we're almost, we're almost out of time. Uh, so you see what I, what I showed you is the proof for KPZ already because the KPZ is just writing one of the epsilon one halves as a delta. And, and then you, 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 then you get a difference between WASEP and, and TASEP, but then you just take the limit and you got the result for KPZ and it just gives you exactly this estimate. Uh, so, so, so the fixed point minus KPZ, as long as you do some averaging is less than this thing. And okay, delta goes to zero, you, you, you know that it converges. So just let me finish up by describing the, the finite range exclusions. So finite range exclusions are a little bit harder but Jeremy, could I just ask? Yeah. For like for the ASAP or for the KPC, what what is the precise statement? Like, what is the class of initial data? And yeah, uh, can I can I answer that in a second? Because yeah. I have a slide to do that. And let me just quickly tell you how you do finite range exclusions. Because just take one second. If you look at this, the the key fact we used about the difference of generators was this estimate star. It tells you uh, that. L1 minus L2, what you see, you can't necessarily integrate that thing by parts uh, it, unless L1 minus L2 is symmetric simple exclusion and get an estimate like star. But if you have the generator of finite range exclusion and the generator of TASEP chosen carefully so that it has the same mean, then the difference of these two things is basically the generator of a mean zero exclusion. And then this estimate, which is called the strong sector estimate, was actually proved by, by Shu and Varadan uh, in the early 90s in hydrodynamic limits. Basically, they proved it because they wanted to show a mean zero exclusion has this fact that it should scale like epsilon minus two. Just like, so it's again, it's the, it's the same heuristics as before. Okay, and this is the only step which is different. And once you have this, and, and now you need to extend it to height functions, stuff like that, everything's the same. So let me answer Ivan's question. Um, so how do you get from, from dense randomized initial data to more general initial condition? So, for, for KPZ and um, some things for ASAP, you, you have a few extra facts which you can use to try to bootstrap your way off these randomized initial conditions. So you see the final condition, this fact that I averaged, it just goes away immediately because you can say, oh, well, the error is just smaller than A and there's no problem, that's the end. But the initial condition, you can't immediately just say, oh, well, I can extend that to all initial conditions unless you can show that things that start together 
close together, stay close together for a long time. So there's two things we know which help you say this for KPZ, and one of them helps for ASAP, and none of them are true for finite range exclusions. So for finite range exclusions, we're kind of stuck at uh, randomized initial data. Um, so for, for KPZ, we have, the, for, so we have these two facts. One of them is skew time reversal invariance, which is the thing written here, which is a way of saying that the process looks uh, this backwards, it looks like it's flipped in time, but it's more than that because, because it's, it is true that backwards in time, finite range exclusions look like the height is flipped. But the important thing, which I should have written here and I didn't, is that the monotonicity is being used here too. So it's extremely important for ASAP and KPZ, if you start with one, um, one uh, function above another, um, one height function above another, it stays that way for all time. But that's not true about finite range exclusions. They can, they can flip past each other. And so the statement as written here, which is the one we need is false. Um, and you know, the skew time reversal invariance means that you can play a game with your initial and final data because you can just, you know, now you know that you can do it for any final data starting from some randomized initial data, but that tells you you can start from any fixed, the final data could become your initial data. And so you can start from any initial data and have some randomized final data. But randomized wedges are just as good as wedges in your final data to test points. And so basically you're done. Um, there's a little bit more you need than that. So for KPZ, you've got this variational formula and that variational formula is extremely helpful because if you know that this proto airy sheet in this variational formula for KBZ is is um, is uh, is Helder, then you know that H is Helder, and that definitely helps you bootstrap your way up from from randomized initial data to final initial data. So the answer is Ivan. That's the method, and and then if you want to know exactly what the result is, you need to look in the paper. <laughs> and I'll stop there. All right, well, let's all thank uh, Jeremy for his talk. Um, we, you know, we're over, so if you want to leave, leave. But I have questions, and maybe others do. Jeremy, uh, we'll, we'll stick yeah, around. I'm sticking. I'm sticking around for questions. Okay. Yeah. So, could you actually go back one slide? So, for the the for KPZ, you use the variational formula. For ASAP, one doesn't have quite such a formula there is no it's fall it's fall. and all that sort of stuff but there's yeah so so how does you know how do oh, you oh you don't yeah because you don't really need the variable <laughs> you can get you can get away with just the uh skew time reversal invariance to get essentially all initial data mm -hmm. yeah okay other questions for jeremy uh, i have a question so can you go back to like the energy page, like about these yeah. inverters? Is this the one? Yeah, yeah. So like, it's so actually like I, I read your paper and, and actually like you, it corresponds to like when you apply the Young's inequality so to put this square like like onto this gradient of the transition yeah. probability. Um, but okay, like I, I checked the Wikipedia the at the Young's inequality like. The version I know is only for like uh, the Lebesgue measure, but here I think you also use um, the version for this uh, this resummation. Is, is that the no, case? No, but it, the, the the same thing is true. Okay. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, if you're on a group, it's fine. Yeah, and, and and in fact, I wrote it purposefully so that I am using Lebesgue measure. <laughs> I would, I am using the version you you read because uh, once you write it like this. I was careful to write it so you can just interpret this as functions on R, which just take constant values on the little bits of the epsilon and epsilon one half lattices. Okay, so I'm actually using exactly the version you said. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and another question, like maybe like Lee has asked. So, and can you explain a, a little bit like why like this this drift term like in your transition probability? So actually, you're, you're not looking. Uh, and look exactly at Tesa, but actually you have a drift because you need to converge to the KPZ fixed point. So, so like, why this drift term like it does not mess things up? Oh, oh, so I'm trying to understand exactly what you're asking. You, do you mean the large constant you have to subtract? 
Yeah, and so this like um, this epsilon inverse time t. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So, so the the question, which is a very good question, is why do those match, right? For for say ASAP and TASAP. Um, is that the question? Uh, yeah, like because for for ASAP and, and TASAP, so like it converges to KPZ equation and KPZ fixed point, and and like in both these convergence, you need to subtract something. Yeah, but it turns out to be the same thing, and I can explain why. So I can even explain why just heuristically. So so since ASAP is TASAP plus symmetric simple exclusion, you can. Symmetric simple exclusion will have no such constant when it goes to um, when it goes to the Edwards Wilkinson. It just flips around. It doesn't go up or down. So when you add symmetric simple exclusion to TASEP, the big shift is just the shift from TASEP. Okay. Yeah. I'm using it like crazy. And, and, you know, so of course, there have been a lot of questions about how general this method is. And the answer is, I just don't know, because this kind of fact is not a generic fact in different systems. You know, I don't know how you would do that in some, you know, polymer model or something. Um, but actually, my question is, like, like even they have the, the same drift, actually, you're dealing with two different dynamics. So like, as time evolves, so like this also, yield, um, this does not yield any problem. Yeah, it's, just, it, it's amazing. It just doesn't even come up. I see. It's, I mean, you, you, you do this and at first you don't even believe how could, how could such a thing be true? But it, it's true. It's because it, it's just because the, 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 the symmetric simple exclusion thing is, is, is like a, it's because you're really perturbing taste up by something which is not affecting much on these scales. Okay, and that might not be, it might not be true for other type of thing you're trying to get universality for that there's anything of that nature. But uh, yeah, that's that's my best answer to you. Yeah, just check, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but the, it does come up on the second page of this, on the second line of this page, right? Uh, where? Uh, second line of this page. Right, because if, I mean, I guess you're using Kolmogorov equation and, and turn that into a, a generator and, and put it, this into a quadratic form. But yeah. if a generator is, is having some extra term, then you need, you need to argue why this equality is still true. Th that, that would be correct, yes, right. So in, in fact, I think what you're saying is just the, what I said in a different language. You see the ASAP evolution, because if you want to check how the uh, L2 norm changes, it's all being driven by uh, here, you know, well, no, that's not the same thing. <laughs> that's not the same thing. No, I, I don't know exactly what you mean. Sorry, I take up back what I was starting to say. I mean, the second line here, if it were operating on occupation variable level, then this is a classical formula. But you're not doing that. You're you're changing the generator. But, but the result is that the right hand side is the same. Okay. It's like you're adding one extra turn to a generator, but it doesn't affect the right hand side. I suppose. Yeah, that's that. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it does come up. It's just that it doesn't come through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, these large constant in ASAP and TASAP is just the rescaled uh, uh, occupation at, at zero one. Okay. Uh, you know, whether there's a particle hole there at zero one. And, and, and you know, it's not too surprising that that kind of the, 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 uh, the ergodic theory of that object is going to be the same in the two processes, they have the same invariant measure. So, I mean, of course, you can wonder if there could be lower order term which were different in the two things, but yeah. Okay. Is your, sorry, one more question. Is your T here big O1 or F1 to the three? No, the T here is just one. So uh, I'm curious. So 
for the second line, you just use the fact that this term is negative. Yeah. But heuristically, could you estimate how fast is the L2 norm decaying? Oh, well, that's, <laughs> of, of course you would like to do that because that's the way you want to try to get past this randomization of the initial data in finite range. But I'm unable to, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. It's a but, good question. But if you look at a different context where you're doing KPC equation, you know there's nothing coming out of this because at yeah. finite time, so that seems to be telling me that likely there's nothing coming out of this either. Maybe. Okay. But but like in the sense that the the quickness of well okay, let me not go on. It's a good it's a good question. <laughs> I don't know what to, to say. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? You use any of the KPC fixed point formulas? You you know you're mentioning you nothing you, nothing. You're computing the derivative of nothing. The, my, my, my idea initially was that I would compute L1 minus L2 using the formula for P. And then it, <laughs> I would keep going. It turned out to be very hard. And then we found this trick. Uh, this, so in this, principle, you could work on the torus and use like Jipeng's stuff and prove. You know, oh, that's true. That. Yeah, yeah, this would, I, I, I assume the same proof would work. Yeah, that's true. It's a good point. Um, yeah, no, the, the only thing I'm using is this uh, skew time reversal invariance to get grad XP taste up to be this, this arg max and max. It, you, you need that, otherwise, otherwise it's a funny thing which you don't know how to deal with. Um, yeah. And how much, so you, you really use the fact that the invariant measure is nice here. And it's the same. Oh, like bananas, like bananas, sure. But you don't need that it's product measure. You just need to have some quantitative control over it. Uh, and well, or the thing is, the thing is when you start doing these integration by parts, if you didn't know it was product measure, you would probably be in deep trouble. Uh, I, it's hard to imagine how this would extend to other things, but I, I don't really want to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to make anyone not try. Perhaps this thing could be extended. I, I would like to think of the following thing that, that this, you know, even if this doesn't work for anything except this case, at least would make people realize this problem is not impossible. <laughs> and they, they should try to, to, to prove universality. It's, you know, we were able to do something. Um, I, I really don't know how far it's going to go because we're using so many special properties. Right. So if you looked at something like LPP with general weights, you wouldn't have. Something. Yeah, no, I, I, I tried to see if this could get anything there. And I, I simply have not the slightest idea how you would use a method like this. It, it looks like it would not do something like that. Yeah. I mean, maybe, you know, so for example, if, if I, I could probably find some non nearest neighbor version of the O'Connell UR model and, and, and do that, I can imagine. Uh, but, but that's the kind of thing you might be able to do this way. I guess, you know, there are lots of zero range processes that they all have different invariant measures. So, so if, if you have different invariant measures, it doesn't work as well, I guess. Two yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I thought a little bit about it, zero range, but th that, again, it looks very hard and you don't have one of them, which you know converges unless you want to try to think of TASAP as some sort of zero range model. But then you try to compare it to the other zero ranges and you don't get very far. Look, maybe it maybe it can work. I, I <laughs> remember the paper was posted on Monday, so so uh, <laughs> anyone wants to try try. I I, I don't know. It, it could work. It that would be nice. Uh, this this strong sector condition isn't particularly easy to prove, by the way. So uh, it's and it's not clear how general it is. Um, okay. Any other questions for Jeremy? Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, maybe you already answered this, but um, do your results for exclusion processes uh, extend to QTASEP? I have no idea. Uh, oh. That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> someone should try. 
it, it's a natural it's a natural thing to try I guess you could try to do it for stochastic six vertex, which has the same invariant measure, but is, you know, yeah, continuous I mean, time. That would be a, an interesting way to measure. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, those are, those would be good ideas. Yes. Right. Okay. Any other questions for Jeremy? Yeah. Just the quick one. This might yeah. fall into the category of, problems that you haven't thought about yet, but it seems like you only need some sort of estimate towards the bottom right page for grad X of P TESA at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. So is it possible maybe to sort of transfer this estimate to P ASAP or something and then compare off of P ASAP to get a better result? Well, you got to remember P ASAP is the thing you don't know. P TESA is the thing you know. You, you want to put as much problem onto p tasep as possible. I guess my question is sort of, if you use this sort of perturbative formula at the top of the page, can you control p tasep using this estimate for p tasep sort of in the same topology or something? Oh, you mean... Maybe. <laughs> the answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, maybe we should let, let Jeremy rest. He, he spoke for a while and now he's been grilled with these questions. And no, oh, it's fine. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, good questions. All right. So let, let's all thank Jeremy again. <laughs>